Well, thank you very much, uh, Darren, and thank you very much for inviting me to do this. And thank you all so much for being here. I'm I'm super excited, and this is a topic I care about a lot. Um, before we kick off, I also wanted to uh, remind folks that we've got um, transcriptions activated for this talk, which means you'll be able to get live captions, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so you'll be able to follow along with Zoom with those. Um, yeah, so yes, welcome. Let's talk about approaching a new code base. Um, this is something that even to this day brings me a little bit of anxiety. So it's something I've started, what I've started doing is sort of jotting down some of my experiences as well as tips and tricks that I found that help me. Um, but once we get to the end of this, I also want to hear from you, but we'll get to that in a bit. Let's talk about getting stuck in general, because there's one thing I want to assure everybody, no matter what skill level you're at, and that's that we've all been there. Here you are approaching a new code base. That's the code base at the bottom left there. We've got some nice code looking symbols there that I hope symbolize code. And at the bottom right, we've got us, the new person entering this code. And we take a look at this code and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sizable piece of code. It's about the size of a house. And we look at it and, you know, it's kind of pretty big. It's a, we would call this a, a monolith, perhaps a monolith code base. But as soon as we start examining it a little closer, we realize, hold up, this isn't a monolith. This is huge. This is a mono repo. And the size and the scope of these code bases as the modules inter interconnect with one another, especially, you know, modern web development stacks that have grown monumentally in the last 10 years or so. The amount of dependencies and all of this that comes into it, we think to ourselves, "Woof, okay, where do I even begin?" and <laughs> and all that. And you know, we get in, and you know, we go in, and we say, "Like, okay, go do the thing." You know, we're told we go into our new job, and we and we're told, "Okay, go do the thing, get started," or you know, "Go add that functionality to your code base," or you know, uh, "Go fix that bug to it," and all of that. And you know, you find yourself being bombarded with instructions maybe you're looking at an open source code base and you're looking at issues and you're kind of like oh you're kind of like okay well hold on hold on <laughs> there's a lot going on here and you think to yourself right okay i know that i have to do the thing but where do i begin where do i start looking what do i start doing and forgive me for being a little cheesy but i'm gonna begin i don't know about the rest of y'all but i'm gonna begin by introducing myself which <laughs> which Darren has already done very kindly. So I'll just keep it short. Hi, <laughs> my name's Ramon. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I said, I'm originally from Chile, but I've been living in Austria for a very long, very, very long time. Um, I do developer relations at Suborbital with some consultancy on the side. I'm also a developer educator. My focus has been on Ruby, JavaScript, and Rust with, of course, a past in macOS and Objective-C. And uh, I care a lot about community stuff. Um, I was very fortunate to be part of something called the Mozilla Tech Speakers Community. And mentorship, as Darren very kindly said, is a big passion of mine. Uh, I just love sharing stuff. I love connecting with others. Um, and I want to take this opportunity before we go into uh, we go into um, we go into the meat of the co this conversation we're about to have. Uh, I just want to say, you know, I do offer some free mentorship. Uh, career advice uh, sessions. If you ever want to get in touch, my Twitter handle's up there at Ola Soy Milk. Please, my DMs are open, and I love, you know, talking to others and you know hearing them out. So uh, <laughs> I see some comments in the chat about me being a DJ. What's happening here is I'm giving, uh, I'm presenting. Uh, are are y'all familiar with the game Dance Dance Revolution? Um, it's a game where you, it's a dancing game, and here I am presenting a JavaScript Bangkok. Uh, about how I made a controller with it for it with some conductive paint and a Raspberry Pi. Something else related. Uh, just a fun picture. <laughs> but yes, I do lots of live streaming as well. And I want to take a minute, if I may, to talk a little bit about live streaming because I think it's really important for me to go live and show the world that even though I've been developing software for 20, 12 years, I don't have all the answers. I don't know. I was talking to to somebody uh, getting ready to level up in their career, and uh, oh, Twitter handle for Ramon. Uh, you will see it at the top left. Oh, it's not there actually. <laughs> uh, I'll. It's it's here. It's uh, at Ola Soy Milk at the top right of the screen. Ah, thank you, Mohammed. Um, 
what I love about what I love about live streaming is that it takes away my abil my ability to be perfect. And one thing I love doing is going live on stream and onboarding onto new code bases. And I think, uh, as Marcus as Marcus in the chat says, I'm just beginning to learn. I'd even go as far as to argue, the learning never stops with developing software. I think it's an ongoing thing. So what I love about live streaming is that I can go on, bring on a guest, for example. Uh, here you can see I'm being onboarded onto a new code base. That's why I'm wearing the uh, sailor's outfit. <laughs> and, you know, I'm doing some open source contributions on code bases that I've never looked at before. And I feel like this is really important to show folks that there is a process to onboarding to a new code base. I feel like this is important to do things like, you know, learn in public how it is that maintainers make so much of an effort to make their software more easy to contribute to. And what I want to reassure you is I enter new code bases a lot and all the time I get stuck all the time. I find myself not knowing where to start, but instead what I've developed are a series of tools. Now today, what we're going to do is, and I'm sorry about the pun again, we're going to navigate <laughs> using an example to be able to do that. And even though, um, this talk is meant to be language agnostic and i'm very very i'm very very keen on that just because i've picked a typescript based code base don't worry too much about the code what some of the um some of the samples are going to be able to be extracted in order to be able to carry these points across now i want to hear from folks have you all heard of excalibur this is an open source tool and i i absolutely love it um what I love about it is that it allows you to sketch in your browser and it's open source and it is wonderful. And here's an old post of, <laughs> you can see this is an old slide because I'm talking to React Vienna. I gave this talk there as well. <laughs> but yeah, it lets you draw stuff and it's written in, um, it's written for the browser. And we're gonna use this, having never looked at the code base, to start diving into it as an example and see how it is that we can get around it and be able to dive into that complex code base. Now, again, a lot of this that what I'm going to share with you today, some of my tips and tricks, they might seem at a glance like, well, yeah, of course, but <laughs> I think it's important to bear in mind. I, I'm a big fan of putting thought words to thoughts, you know, so having some having some formality there helps me to understand better how it is that I do things on a daily basis. So let's talk about getting the code up and running. Let's talk about going, here's a screenshot from GitHub, to the repository page for Excalibur and just getting a glance at what's going on here. Seeing, for example, what the programming language is. I mentioned before this is TypeScript. I see that there is some SCSS involved, some JavaScript involved, and so on and so forth. There, I see some Docker involved here. I don't know anything about Docker, but we're gonna you know, learn to navigate this around and see how it is that we can get it up and running. And some of the steps that we have from familiarity from working with software are going to apply um, to getting a code base <laughs> up and running. And again, these are things that you might think, well, yeah, I do this all the time. But I think, again, it's important to formalize them. I think it's important to like, I like to have a checklist. I'm a big checklist person of being like, okay, I clone the repo, I take a look at the readme, I install the dependencies, start up a development environment and run the tests. Why? Because even though I haven't done anything yet, having that first, like, I'm a big skimmer, you know, I skim, I skim read a lot. And what I like about doing this, especially with when I'm contributing to new software, is that I am bound to run into little issues. For example, maybe it's possible that the development environment that I'm in, uh, I tend to develop a lot of software in, uh, are you all familiar with uh, Windows subsystem for Linux? This is like Linux inside Windows. Uh, supported by Windows, and a lot of the time I found that a lot of uh, some software isn't built with developing <laughs> WSL, as Donald K says, in mind. And yeah, so I, and I I often find that there's some issues there, and I these I find are important to be able to encourage me, the contributor, to dig a little deeper, but also help the maintainer figure out okay where are these pitfalls. To be able to do this, again, I use tools that might seem familiar to all of you. Debuggers, for example, 
in, in the case of, for example, my browser, I'm using the using the Firefox dev tools. But of course, these can be debuggers in all kinds of contexts, be it, for example, uh, back in my macOS development days, I use something called LLDB to be able to debug my macOS apps. Um, and again, your browser has all of this functionality built in that makes it so easy and so straightforward to be able to, to debug your applications and see what's going wrong or even what's going right. Here you see a screenshot of me debugging uh, Excaladra. Sorry, the name escaped me for a second. <laughs> and I can see, okay, we've got a canvas here, for example. If you're familiar with it, this allows me to draw 2D graphics onto a browser canvas. Um, so that starts giving me an idea of what to expect. And debuggers come in all shapes and sizes, so much so that nowadays, Debuggers even come built into our editors. Here's a screenshot from um, Visual Studio Code's website that has it right there, where you can do your debugging and being able to figure out what it is that's going wrong and what it is about your WSL setup <laughs> that makes it that makes it trip up in certain places. Now, again, I know I keep saying this, but a lot of this might seem like, yeah, of course. But I think it's important to really be kind of automatic about trying these things out because you never know what are the pitfalls you're going to run into in your development experience for example now that you know the apple world speaking of apple is transitioning into these new um, cpu architectures the m1 architectures a lot of software still especially some open source software still isn't built with that in mind so being able to help out by testing this helps you already get up and running with contributing so step two right again <laughs> might sound super obvious, but I want to really stress this. Let's talk about going through the dependencies. Now, I've mentioned some of the, the coding uh, competencies I have, some of the languages I've worked with, and these can come in different shapes and sizes. For example, in my Ruby on Rails days, I would go through the gem file, you know, the listing of development uh, dependencies for Ruby. For my Rust days, I will go through the Cargo Tomal, which is a listing of dependencies for Rust projects. But here we're talking about a TypeScript project, which means we're going to be used, talking about package JSON. And we're just what I usually do is before I, before I do anything else, just dive right in, open it up, and just see what dependencies are listed here. I can see, for example, just at a glance, okay, right, TypeScript. We mentioned that before. I see Sentry, which from what I gather, and I'll sometimes Google these just to have a look at what's going on. Uh, I see Sentry for doing my my um, error error diagnosis. Uh, I see TypeScript, of course. I see React. Okay, this is a React app. Firebase, we've got some Firebase going on here, and so on and so forth, giving me an idea of what makes up the architecture of this app. Same goes for the scripts, by the way. So in different code, different languages, this will come in different places. For JavaScript or TypeScript ones, I already have that built into the package JSON file, which again, I love script. I love looking at the scripts because it gives me an idea of what to expect from the setup and expectations for things like running tests, uh, being able to build the final version of the app. For example, I can see here, our tests are being run with, let's see what we got. Test all oh, npm run test type check yes lint we got linting very good yeah there's a whole bunch of scripts here that help me take a look like okay what it is that I can expect from building this app I see a build a, a custom build script this sort of thing helps me take a look at okay what can I expect when I'm trying to go in deeper into a code base I like to do what I call piecemeal refactoring I'll tell you what I mean in a sec. It's a hot day today and I'm getting a little dehydrated. Pardon me, folks. So yeah, let's talk about piecemeal refactoring. And to do that, I'm going to take a look at this file here, source actions, action select all.ts. And I'm just trying to, you know, look at it and understand what it is that's going on here. So what do we got? We've got, for example, let's say I want to understand this piece of code that I've highlighted here better, the selected element IDs, which is a which is an anonymous function. What I like to do in cases like this, where it looks kind of chunky and complicated to me, where I like will say, okay, I'm gonna extract a function from here. I see it's an anonymous function. I'm just gonna extract a function here and give it a name. And something that might seem as simple as naming already starts letting me sort of piece together what it is that this piece does here and, and forces me to try and understand what's what it's doing. It kind of becomes a tool that I start applying to sort of chip away at the app. Now, I want to be very clear. 
do I, am I trying to imply that whenever we're trying to, you know, understand a code base that we should just go in and refactor the whole thing? Absolutely not. In fact, I would even go as far as to say it should not be something that we want to do wholesale. If there are refactorings that are helpful, absolutely, but it's piecemeal. It's for me to be able to understand better and being able to take a large piece of code and just shrink the, the scope, shrink the context really well helps me. And it allows me to be able to test, which segue is what we're gonna be checking out next. Let's talk about tests. Now, if you're not familiar with them, software tests are tiny programs we run in order to check that an app is running correctly. We run those, we, sorry, we write those tests ourselves. And I think this is some, something important to bear in mind. And I love tests. I love looking at a good test suite, kind of get taking a bird's eye view at something as complex as a piece of software and being able to use the tests to be able to say, okay, this is what this is. And, and it's very scoped down as well, isn't it? To be able to say, hey, okay, this is what this piece of code is expected to do. And being able to look at that and run it and, say, and verify that the code does indeed do what I expect it to do. If you're ever curious about really understanding and reading more about uh, where, uh, what good software testing is, I highly recommend the work of Martin Fowler. Uh, I will provide a link as well uh, in my resources because I think he does a terrific job that helped me be able to understand how to write good tests. We're not gonna go too deep into writing good tests today. But I will cover briefly, again, why it is that it's so important for me, especially in the context of um, in the context of uh, Excaladraw, to be able to look at a single test, for example, okay, we're looking at the export, um, uh, at the export functionality of Excaladraw. Very specifically, we're testing how to export embedded PNGs and re-import them. Just from that forces me to understand how it is that this is supposed to work. Now, you might be wondering, well, that's great when there are tests, but oftentimes tests are either completely missing or for specific parts are missing. This is where I would really recommend taking a chance at trying to implement these, trying to recommend, trying to suggest these tests, trying to say, hey, you know, I noticed that this part isn't tested. What do you think of this proposed test? So again, keeping that test, um, keeping that test really locked in as a way to be able to say, okay, what it is that we're doing here helps me understand better how it is that I can do this. Let's talk about looking stuff up. <laughs> I find that, um, especially as I'm mentoring folks who are getting started in their coding careers, that when you reach a certain level of seniority, that we never have to look stuff up again, that we have all of the syntax for all of the things in our heads, and we are always good to go. And I want to assure you that that is absolutely not the case. So let's talk about what that means. What that means is Honestly, so much of what I do is just taking an error message and just plugging it into my search engine of choice. If I'm trying to build something with, say, Yarn, which is a build uh, a packaging tool for uh, um, JavaScript projects, just being able to be like, OK, you know what? I'm just going to plug in into my search engine Yarn error 137 and being able to find out what other people have done. Because oftentimes, you're not the only one who has run into this error. And I think that's really important to bear in mind. <laughs> Why it is that, for example, that build error happens in WSL. Maybe you're not the only one who's run into that. Maybe even this is a great point to be able to bring it to the maintainer so that they can say, hey, is this something that would go well into an FAQ, a frequently asked question section? I think this is really important. In case you're curious, by the way, yarn error 137, <laughs> in case you don't know it, uh, is something that is ingrained to my memory for the rest of my life because it is an error that happens when the computer that you're running yarn in runs out of memory, runs out of RAM. And I remember once I was coding live on stream and I was trying to build the free code camp, um, 
the Free Code Camp code base. If you're not familiar with Free Code Camp, it's uh, one of the one of the largest open source building materials uh, for learning. And I remember seeing error 137 and saying, Whew, okay, um, what does this mean? And I remember think, finding out that this meant run out of memory. Whew, this is complicated, <laughs> but it's never ever going to leave my head again. Let's talk about Stack Overflow solutions. Again, Stack Overflow is a magnificent piece of, uh, magnific magnificent platform to be able to find out answers to the questions that you're stuck on. But I don't know about you, but I never wondered, am I allowed to just copy paste the code that's on Stack Overflow? And if so, is that a bad thing? Because a lot of people will tell you, you know, never ever copy from Stack Overflow. And here's what I want to talk about that. And I want to open up this conversation uh, also for the Q&A section as well. So what it is that we want to do when we're copying a piece of code? Why are we copying a piece of code? When I'm copying over a piece of code from Stack Overflow, what I try to do is test it so that to see if that's a solution that works for me. Part one. Part two, refactoring. Take a piece of code from Stack Overflow, refactor it, and see if it still works because refactoring it helps me try and understand what it is that's going on in that in this piece of code that I'm copying and therefore see if it <laughs> see if I can apply it. But the third part is am I allowed to use this? And I learned that Stack Overflow does have a license for the code that's there under Creative Commons with attribution. What this means is and what I usually do is whenever I use a piece of code, again, not copied, but refactored from or adapted from Stack Overflow for my needs, I will leave myself, but of course others, a link to where this discussion happened so that I can remind myself why it is that I used it. I'm just going to take a sip here. So what about packages? <laughs> I've sometimes found that when packages get updated over time, that some parts of them will break. And I don't know about you, but I would highly recommend, here's for example, a problem I was having with a different code base where I had to dig into the dependencies GitHub repository to find out what was going on here. And if you're not familiar with what you're seeing in the screenshot, um, I was building a mobile app with React Native and I was having some trouble building the Android app. Whew, it was, it was a lot. <laughs> Finally, the last thing, um, the last thing I want to talk, cover today, or one of the last parts I want to cover today is about asking for help. Again, something that might seem obvious, but I want to go a little bit further than asking for help. I want to talk about asking for help effectively. Asking for help is something that we all do, should sometimes need to do, sometimes should do when developing software, especially if we're in a team, if we have the benefit of being in a team. And a question that I get asked a lot by people who are getting started in programming is, how long should I wait before asking for help? I would love to get a read from of the room right in chat, please. How long do you wait until you ask for help? And the reason I want to ask this is because, and I'm sure you've all wondered this, spending too little time to solve a problem blocks us from practicing or learning uh, or learning problem solving, but taking too long or never asking for help can sometimes hold either the team or the timeline of a project back. One piece of advice that I'm often, that I was given early in my career, because I can tell you from my side, um, I used to take days before I would ask for help because I felt if I'm if I'm not doing this quickly or sorry if I can't solve this on my own I'm doing this wrong. And one piece of advice I was given was to be consistent in how long I wait. So for example, my rule of thumb and bearing in mind this can vary from project to project, team to team, context to context, my rule of thumb is to give something about half an hour before I start reaching out. Let me see what folks are saying here in the chat. Let's see, we got 
we got a day, we got two days, a few hours, two hours, two to four, until I'm satisfied I've tried enough. See, it can be, it can vary. Sleep on it if possible. I love that. That's great. Um, yeah, this is, this is great advice. For me, again, it's a heuristic that everybody that will vary from person to person, but I like being consistent and I like recommending folks to be consistent. When I actually go and ask for help, I also have a bit of a strategy there that I would recommend to everybody. For example, I recommend asking narrow pointed questions. I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Uh, sometimes something can be as easy as just saying, hey, um, this doesn't work. Can you take a look? Have you ever asked that question or have you ever been approached with that question? And um, how blocking it can be to not be more specific about what you're trying to solve, what you're trying to ask for help with. For example, instead of asking, hey, this is broken, can you take a look? How about asking, hey, you know, I've noticed that I can't seem to log in since I act, um, uh, since I upgraded this dependency. Could you help me take a look? And what I like about this is it sort of invites folks to start thinking in the background. You know, we're, we're humans, we do lots of, I, I, I don't wanna say we do multitasking, but there is a part of my brain that starts thinking about the problem as I'm talking about it. And I feel like this is important to bear in mind for doing things like being able to provide the best help that I can. So if you can, try and ask a question that's as specific as possible with the problem you're having. I think it's also important to, to try and share what I've tried. Because <laughs> for lack of a better term, right, it's easy to just tempted to be like, oh, yeah, have you tried, you know, turning it off and uh, off and on again, right? If I can cover the basis saying things like, oh, I've deleted my node modules folder. Oh, I've, you know, tried restart uh, doing a hard refresh. Things like this can start eliminating possibilities and help the person who's helping you get started faster in solving that problem. But of course, Reproducing the problem is a big issue too, isn't it? What I try to do is, especially when working asynchronously um, with other people, is um, is to try and have a set of reproducible steps. I'll be like, you know, npm install, do this, take this step here, click here, and give a, a series of steps so that you can try and reproduce the problem. So that by the time you're pairing with this person, pairing we'll get into in a bit, um, you can already have a set of steps that helps you get going quickly. And let's talk about pairing, because I think pair programming is, frankly, one of my favorite things to do. If you're not familiar with it, pair programming involves two people coding on one computer. One is called the navigator, giving instructions, uh, guiding the other person. The driver is the person who's doing the actual typing. So I think it's important to be able to try and find the members of your team who can help you. And of course, let me be very, very honest with you. This is bearing in mind that you have the you have access to this. If you have access to team members, if you have access to maintainers who can help you, do not be afraid to talk to them. This is advice for myself when I was younger as well. Let's talk about pairing. Let's talk about ensemble programming. Have you all heard of ensemble programming? It's kind of an extension of pair programming where you've got not only a navigator and a driver, but you've got an ensemble of folks with you. I sometimes do this, especially with when live streaming with folks, I will let the chat be the ensemble and make, have them make recommendations. And these tend to be extremely productive as well. Once I've been able to make my contribution to a code base, let's talk about improving that onboarding. Yeah, how important it is to be able to, now that you've been through the experience, now that you've got that fresh perspective of working in a code base, Nothing is stopping you from taking the steps you can and making the proposals that you can so that the next person that comes into that code base has an easier time that, than you do. Doing things like, and there's, some, there's so much more that I wish I could cover in this presentation, things like an architecture write-up, things like a walkthrough that I think one can provide 
as part of their onboarding experience so that the next onboarding experience is as smooth as possible. But unfortunately, time marches on and I have to wrap up there. So again, oh, Elijah rec talk, uh, mentions Project Wikis. I love this. Project Wikis, again, a great place to write up your exp where things go in a code base. So I want to hear from you as well. So we've got a Q&A session coming up shortly. I want to take that opportunity to have this turn into a conversation. So please bring in some ideas, bring in some suggestions, bring in your experiences, because I want to hear from you as well. But something I would just want to mention before I before I go is we've all been there and we will all continue to be there because code is big, code is complex, and code grows over time. As I think I mentioned that before this um, uh, session started, Da Vinci said, you know, what is it? Great art? No, art is never art is never completed, only abandoned. And I think the same applies to software. So thank you, folks. Here are some resources that I mentioned previously. And I just want to say, get in touch. Um, I want to hear from you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for joining. Cool. All right. Wow. Thanks so much, Ramon. That was awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, <laughs> very kind. You, you, made, you made this subject. Yeah. I, I... I don't know how people feel about it. I imagine some people probably feel like, ah, oh, it's such a chore, you know, to go through a new code base. But I think you made it pretty, pretty straightforward and kind of fun to to understand. It feels like it's like an adventure kind of thing. <laughs> it is. So, yeah. It is. I think I think for me the most important, what really helps me is to bear in mind and remember that I'm not alone. Mm. Yeah. Oh, um, got a question, got a point here from Steffi saying show the resources sure. page again yes totally <laughs> sorry i oh, kind of got nice. nervous yeah, yeah i get i get nervous when making presentations <laughs> really well could have fooled um, me couldn't tell <laughs> very kind um cool do we want to like uh start look shall i start reading out these convers uh, these um questions then yeah yeah let me let me yeah so Feel free. Yeah, people are already starting to to drop the questions in the Q and A. Um, so feel free to keep doing that as we as we do this. Um, totally. Yeah. Let me. I'll I'll read it. I'll start from the top. I think uh, what I'm seeing here is Mohammed. Um, shouldn't yeah. we have an initial objective that guide us to explore the code base so that we don't get lost in that big ocean? And Marcus concurred. Yeah. We need some goals before we touch a code base. So hmm. I want to make sure that I understand the question correctly. So this is, you know, when we're being given an objective, that would mean, again, correct me if I'm wrong, going into a code base with a clear objective, say, for example, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, being given a task, implementing a, implementing a feature, fixing a bug. Uh, I'm a big fan of bug fixing when I'm, when I'm uh, entering a new code base, because I can recognize bugs. I think we can recognize bugs, especially if there are tests that are broken. Um, I think that helps me sort of, again, I like to, I like to apply my, uh, what are these called, Darren? You know what I mean? Like these things that, that help me like stay focused on one thing. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <not sure. laughs> but do you, do you all know what I mean? Like these, these sort of like these sort of things that that you can put on to sort of make sure that you're not looking all the way, but just like in one direction to sort like of like a physical thing. Yeah. Oh, blinders. Thank you, Benton. Oh. Um, or blinkers. Oh, okay. Blind. Gotcha. That's not a that's not the best word for it, I think, because <laughs> yeah, blinders would. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go offhand uh, off off topic. Um, <laughs> what I like about that, you know, fixing bugs, for example, is that it helps me sort of really focus in on one specific section of the code. Um, and this helps me sort of, you know, have a goal that I can go in to fix that specific part so that it kind of, in my mind, kind of unlocks the rest of the code base. And this is, by the way, super generalizing because it is possible that one, that one part touches another part of the code base, which touches another part of the code base. And this is where having resources like approaching from outside in is what helps me a lot. Um, mm. I hope that, I hope that helps. 
Uh, I hope that answers your question, Mohammed. But thank you very much for asking. Awesome. Yeah, let's uh, let's keep moving. Oh, okay. You gotta forgive me if I, if I don't pronounce it right. Uh, Avanidra um, asked, "How how do you touch base with the co-developers of an open source project? Is there any forum to join an existing open source project?" I love this question. Uh, I love this question because. Um, I don't know about you. So I, I, I have some pretty intense anxiety and I sometimes feel like, uh, who am I to just message, you know, DM a, a maintainer out of the blue and, mm -hmm. you know, bu bug them on their day off or something. Um, so here's what I, here's what I usually do with, with projects that I'm helping to maintain with pro open source communities that I'm helping, uh, involve people in is to use the resources that they provide so that we can make it easier on them. What I, what I mean is you will off, you know, most open source projects will be on GitHub, for example, and every GitHub, well, most GitHub repositories will have an issues page. And that's a great place to be able, again, bearing in mind what the, what the recommendations they have for writing issues are, to open an issue and say, for example, oh, you know, I'm having some trouble with this. Looking at an issue, and this is something that I've done in the past, is to you know, comment on an issue and say like something like, "Hey, um, I'd love to work on this. Could I ask for some mentorship?" This is something that I try to provide in my open source projects because I think it's important for folks to be able to 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 know that you're there, you've got their back. You just don't have the time. However, maintainers are human beings. Maintainers have energy. Human beings have energy. Human beings have limited time. Please. If some if if a certain avenue of communicating with somebody isn't working, it's because it's not the appropriate one. Um, I've got a book I would recommend called uh, "Working in Public" by Nadia Eggball. Let me get a link. Uh, please forgive me, everybody. Uh, Nadia.xyz. She wrote this book on what what it's like to be uh, you know an, an open source maintainer. I, she mentions it on her website here. Um, and, and the, the, you know, the importance of the humanity of it. Um, but open source maintainers will oftentimes have things like forums, Discord communities, Slack communities. I'm probably missing something cool and new that I'm not aware of because, you know, I've, I'm relatively young. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there, there are places to get in touch with them. And sometimes they have large maintainer uh, communities that you can get into and help out with. Um, actually, there's another topic that I really love talking about, and that is non-code contributions. Uh, how to That's helped me get into uh, open source projects, but that's a talk for another day. Sorry, I kind of rambled there. I hope that I, that answered your question, Avanindra. Yeah, no problem. Um, all right, next is Moss. Uh, okay, C3, okay, it's the same question. The, Moss said, I'm new to an established C++ code base. He has multiple projects in the solution. Is there a way to automatically visualize the dependencies of the code? Mm. And, and Dhruv here, I, sorry, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, some teams says, I, some teams I've worked with use tools like Turbo, Turbo Repo slash NX to visualize these dependencies. And yes, there are some great tools out there. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to very cheekily plug, um, if I may, the tool that the company, my previous company was, is working on called Code C. Uh, let me just drop a link in there. And that is exactly for this. It's for, um, <laughs> I'm not working with them anymore, but it's a great tool um, uh, for doing exactly this, visualizing code bases. And this is something that I find really helpful if you can provide that to your new contributors. There's another one that's something called like, uh, ooh, Mermaid? GitHub, something like that. Is it called Mermaid? Give me one sec, folks. Yes! Oh, I'm going to drop this one again. Uh, uh, sorry, as well. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Let me just get rid of it in Spanish because I don't want to send you all Spanish links. Um, check out Mermaid. This is a great way to create diagrams as well um, in Markdown for your GitHub repository. Uh, these are both really really great tools for being able to do things like visualize those code bases. I hope that helps. Awesome. All right, let's keep going. Um, Elijah, 
what would you do in the worst case scenario? For example, okay, so you onboard to a team that has just recently lost its most knowledgeable member for whatever reason, and there is no slash subpar external knowledge base about the code slash business rules. Ooh. This is an excellent question. Thank you, Elijah. Um, and this is a tricky one. Um, <laughs> I've been there in kind of a funny slash different way. Um, I've had to go back to a code base that I wrote eight years ago and be like, what the heck is going on here? And not remembering, does that count? Because I was the one who wrote it and then I couldn't remember what I did. <laughs> I think it counts. Um, and this is where doing things to sort of, <laughs> Elijah says that definitely yeah. counts. Great. Um, this is where using these tools that these these tips that I've mentioned here, you know, messing around with uh, dependencies a few years ago, um, a few years ago, I went it came into a react native code base that hadn't been touched in a year. And if you're familiar with mobile development, a year is a very, very long time. <laughs> so nothing was working. And honestly, it took time. It took patience. It took um, it took energy. I Whenever I'm stuck on something, one of my favorite debugging tools that I probably should mention in this presentation as well is um, taking a break. I tend to be quite, I don't want to, I, I, I tend to be quite stubborn when it comes to solving problems. And so when I, when I take a break and I go out for a walk, I'll walk my dog or something, go on a walk with my spouse. Um, my, the back of my head is still debugging. It's still like, ah, oh, but what if I try, you know, I don't know, deleting the node modules folder, but something more tricky than that. I try to not, I try to accept that there's no, that there's probably not going to be a, a, little, little, a switch that I flip that's going to fix all of my problems instantly, unfortunately. And I think it's important to be patient. I think it's important to be kind with myself. I'm not a computer. I'm not a debugger. I am not a compiler. I will need to time and patience to solve this. Depending on the team, sometimes hiring a consultant or a specialist, if this is something your team slash budget can provide, who specializes in this kind of thing, maybe that's something they can do as well. I have to admit, I don't know of many people who do that. I think I could do that for fun. I'm not going to promise that live in front of people. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think, you know, breaking it down is something really important. And like I try to do it step by step, right? For example, um, you know, if I'm upgrading that large React Native code base, I will start with, okay, let's uh, update this one dependency and try and install, and a whole bunch of stuff breaks. So I will break those little things one by one. Divide and conquer, great, is a tool that I recommend so much of just breaking it down and being like, okay, fix this dependency, fix this dependency one by one by one. And in, in, st in lockstep, get to the point where, okay, now it builds, but it doesn't work. Go into the go into the console. Be like, okay, why aren't I seeing anything? And step by step, getting things working to a point, and accept that, especially at a in this worst case scenario that you mentioned, Elijah, you're not going to catch everything. That is the sad truth. But you're doing your part to put in that groundwork. You're laying that groundwork so that the next person. Uh, so that when you leave that code base, you at least leave sufficient and robust documentation and tools so that folks can come into that new code base and be like, okay, I know what's going on. I hope that answers your question. Great. Yeah, when I was well, I was a computer science major back in college, I remember, yeah, solving bugs in the shower or just sleeping on it. Um, just some random, you know, breaks that I took sometimes I'll Mm -hmm. find ways that I haven't thought of before. And it's one reason if, for those of you who are students, one reason not to pro procrastinate, because I think, you know, back then I, I had to make sure I factor in the time that I struggle <laughs> uh, yeah. getting stuck on something into, you know, the, the, the time that I needed to complete a project or homework or whatever. So totally I can relate to that. Yeah. All right, this next one. Oh, I'm so sorry. I might not be able to, to pronounce that name correctly. Um, as I, I want to do my first open source contribution, but when I open issues, I feel like I'm not that capable enough. Um, and also going through the code base, I find difficult. Yeah. Ooh, and, and Will is doing a great, Will is giving a great comment here that I would recommend as well. A lot mm -hmm. of projects, I'm going to read it out if I may. 
yeah, yeah, but this is ahead. Will words, Will's words, not mine. So thank you, Will. Um, a lot of projects will have quote low hanging fruit or first commit type tags. Also, in general, good projects have contributors that are glad to help walk you through contribution guidelines and processes. And I couldn't have put it any better myself. Um, a lot of um, a lot of projects will have what are called a lot of open source projects will have what are called good good uh, good first issues or beginner friendly or beginners only or first good first PR, you know, pull requests, something like this. Um, I find these to be really helpful. But where do you go to find these? Um, this is where I want to get into as well. Um, so my friend Brian from GitHub has a project called Open Sauced. Have you all heard of this? Um, when so this Brian, is, is he the, the DevRel person at GitHub? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, he has this project called open source. Now this is for folks maintaining projects to be able to, you know, uh, and, and also looking for projects to be able to find projects to contribute to. This is a fantastic community and I highly recommend checking it out. I also love the name <laughs> it's cause it's yeah. sharing the secret sauce. Um, mm. yeah, highly recommend checking that out. Uh, there's a couple, there's another one, uh, the GitHub explore page I find really helpful. Um, uh, what, where, where's something like good first issue something like that is it good first issue dot dev yes i think it's good first issue um i'll put that here as well um these are listings of projects with as i said good first issues that are friendly to beginners um i would you know if you're uh if you're ever looking into and i'm gonna can i can i plug an open source project that i'm contributing to as well why not yeah, yeah. um <laughs> We're, we're always looking for help at distribute aid, um, distribute aid. So I'll just plug a link in there, uh, which is a humanitarian aid, uh, delivery organization. We're open source mm -hmm. as well. And we're always looking for contributors. If y'all want to, and I'm happy to walk y'all through, uh, whatever you want to, whatever you want to help with, uh, of course it takes time. It takes dedication and, uh, yeah whatever whatever like these these two the, these two first platforms that i mentioned are fantastic places to to look awesome oh uh, okay oh, oh start another question Sadios, uh, when when tasked with enhancing an old code base with new features what is your criteria for fighting the old versus writing new code that replaces the old Ooh. let me let me read that out again when tasked with enhancing yeah. an old code base with oh, new features. Okay. What is your criteria for fighting the old versus writing new code that replaces the old? That's a good question. Thank you. Uh, Sadiel, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, wow, I love this question. Um, because it is, it's, it's tempting to want to refactor the whole thing, isn't it? Especially because these things cascade, don't they? Because you fix one thing and then you find that it's being used somewhere else and so on and so forth. And I think with experience, and I could be wrong, I want folks to also like chime in on the chat. Um, with experience, you start getting a feeling for where a code, sm uh, um, a code smell is like, hmm, maybe not good. Uh, or uh, if you're not familiar with it, a code smell is something that gives you an impression of like, oh yeah, maybe this is a good place to refactor or something like that. Um, what I tend to do is, if I find a piece of code that I want to modernize per se, if we're talking about React, right? Uh, going from classes to hooks, right? Um, I find that relying on tests. I'm not gonna touch code unless I'm writing tests for it. So either rely on those tests or write new tests that help me make sure that the refactorings I'm doing cover what's going on in this old code. Um, but please, folks, feel free to disagree. <laughs> I want to hear from you as well. I want to I want to read out a comment, if I may, from Benton. I was taught yes. that if you have to leave lots of comments, then you might want to refactor. Learning a little bit about functional programming really helped me to be clear about what steps I was take, taking in my code. And I like that. I like that. Um, that's that's really, really, that's really, really solid. When I, you know, when I was starting out um, on the topic of comments, and maybe that's something I wish I should have covered more. Uh, 
when I was when I was learning how to code, I was taught that good code doesn't require comments. And I want to I want to be very clear. I don't think it's I don't think it's very accurate. Um, I think there will be pieces of code that need to be complemented by comments to be able to describe better, to be able to document better what it is that they're doing. So yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry, I, I've been rambling for a while and I realize we're running out of time here. How we, I, I don't want to keep you, Darren. It's quite late there. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Yeah, I think- Shall we do um, one more? Yeah, this this one, well, this is a quick one. I think somebody might be interested in the distributedaid.org that you mentioned. Someone's, uh, Amnesia is asking how they could get in touch with you. If everyone is yeah. involved with it. Here, I'll tell you what. I'll do you one. Oh, sorry. I unshared my screen. Um, I'll do you one better, uh, Vanindra. Let me get you the link to the GitHub for DistributeAid. Uh, we actually live stream every week as well, are doing our open source development. And yeah. Um, here, I'll put in. We've got some issues there. Feel free to chime in uh, into any of them. It's, uh, it's a TypeScript, uh, sorry, it's a Graph uh, Gatsby web page that I'm working with uh, distributed most of the time. So feel free to contribute there. <laughs> Moss says, I, I enjoyed your rambling the most. That's very Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I, I popped the link into the, uh, into yep. the chat there. All right, there you go. And they saw it, great. Okay. <sighs> um, yeah, so in the interest of time, just want to uh, officially do a little wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Ramon, again, for, for talking to us. And, and thank you, everybody, for being such a positive and engaging audience. This is definitely some of the most fun that I've had for, for, for oh, events. I'm glad. I had a wonderful yeah, time, too. Awesome, awesome. And, and let me put some links. So that includes Ramon's Twitter, uh, if you want to uh, in touch with him. You know, to find it one second. Let's get into the wrong format for some reason. Wait for the links here. Can you see it? Okay, good. You yep. didn't mess up the format. Okay, yeah. So, so you can follow Ramon on his Twitter handle is over here. Um, and we have a next event. Let me just make a quick um, introduction. Uh, the next event is called A First Look at Deploying Smart Contracts on Avalanche. So it's, uh, it's more of a Web3 related topic, and that's your thing. Uh, we, we're curious about it, then we're free to, to join the event. Um, and before I forget, I, I always like to do this. Uh, so Ramon, um, before we officially end, do you have any final remarks or encouragement that you'd like to share with your audience? Just be kind to yourself, folks. We're all human beings and we all have energy. Yeah. And we've all been yeah. there. 